All right, so our, our, our next panel includes uh, Christopher Brader, David Schneer, and Jeffrey Robinson. I will once again turn things over to them. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, first of all, can everybody see that picture clearly enough? Because it'll kind of make everything I'm doing moot if you can. Sorry? Make the picture louder. Make the picture louder, okay. I will do my best. Um, uh, okay, so interdisciplinary, well, what do we, with or the humanities, that is the topic of this panel. And uh, one of the uh, answers to that question, one that uh, uh, David Ferris has just reminded us has been in, in, in play for some time now, is interdisciplinarity. So that's part of what I'm going to be doing now. And then, uh, with the help, uh, as you'll see, I hope, uh, the treacherous help of that window in the background of this picture, I'm also going to be trying to talk a bit about the world uh, and the fact that we actually live uh, in an inconstant uh, and, and multifarious uh, universe uh, that is constantly beckoning us. Uh, the particular form in which that takes in literary studies today, I think Jeffrey will talk about that, is this thing called world literature. Uh, and the conviction that you can't teach literature at all if you aren't teaching all of God's children's literatures. But we'll see. Um, in the spirit of a comment from a moment ago, uh, we've been talking about having sex, and now I propose to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually going to do what humanists in particular, and art historians too, tend to do. Um, uh, namely, to take a picture or a text and talk about it. Um, and uh, it's for that reason, among other things, that I've given you an image that shows us a bunch of humanists. Uh, uh, Justice Lipsius, the guy with the, um, in the middle there with the leopard skin stole, uh, gesturing with his right hand, uh, author, among other things, of a, a neoclassic uh, text called De Constantia, on constancy. Uh, uh, Jan Vauver, he's the fellow to the left, uh, of Lipsius, who is uh, a humanist in his own right and something of a disciple of, uh, of Lipsius. And then to Lipsius's right, we have Philip Rubens, the brother of the painter. Uh, and standing over there on the far uh, left is Rubens himself. Uh, and this is a picture called The Four Philosophers. And what reason for giving you this picture is, A, it's an object of the kind that humanists and art historians talk about, namely an individual object. Uh, one of the big differences between the natural sciences and the social sciences on the one hand and the arts and humanities on the other is that they deal in laws of which particular things tend to be instances and we deal with individuals. And though we invoke natural laws and social laws at times to help us make sense of those individuals, nevertheless individuals is what we would begin with and individuals is where we come back. Uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, it's really hard to get and put us out of business. You can understand how a particular science might one day complete itself. Uh, and after that point, there's nothing left to be said. We have solved problem X. Uh, but the arts and the humanities, there's no end to it because there's no end to the individuals we have created or will go on to create. And what is more, there's no end to the individuals who talk about the objects. Uh, that have been created or will be created. Uh, and so the game goes on forever, uh, which is just as well because I have no other way to earn a living. <laughs> <laughs> In any event, one reason for taking this picture is not only is it an exemplary individual, one that I hope you will find, uh, there is a lot to be said about, and, and I hope to give you a chance to have your say about this picture too, but it's also an image of a bunch of humanists doing what humanists do. They're sitting around a text, presumably they're all holding copies of the same text, uh, and they're talking about it. Um, and uh, one of the things that's most endearing about this picture is how beautifully Rubens has rendered uh, an image of the talking about a book. Um, the three uh, humanists, philosophers, sitting at the table, the ones who seem to be most directly interested in the text, rather than Rubens himself who seems to be texting, uh, outside. <laughs> Those three are doing what we also do when we talk about text, namely they're looking off into space someplace. Um, Lipsius is holding forth, and there's that wonderful right, left, right hand there, where he does, it's a gesture I think that's familiar to us all. You're really reaching for something important. You're really reaching for something uh, meaningful, but it's wonderfully intangible and abstract. 
there you are, your hand, this mimicry of palpation, is sort of lending support to your brain and your language as you try to get them around, whatever it is you're trying to seize out of the void. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Fauverius and Philip Rubens are also sort of thinking about what he's saying, also looking off blindly into space, uh, trying on the one hand to see if uh, what Lipsius is saying rings true uh, to some insight that they carry within their own breasts, but also trying to see whatever it is Lipsius is trying to show to them, something way off in the distance someplace, uh, way off in the distance probably uh, scrutinized by Seneca, uh, in whose spirit this picture is taking place. You notice there's that bust up on the, uh, in the niche on the upper right. That is the head of the uh, Stoic philosopher, ancient Stoic philosopher Seneca, looking again off beyond the far horizons of determinate being to the changes, radiance of the truth to which his philosophy, like Lipsius's, urges us to remain constant. So, there we have it, a, a nice representation of what humanists tend to do and what humanists tend to look, that humanists tend to look like when they're doing it. <laughs> but of course, this is a painting. And it's a painting by one of the participants, one of the four philosophers. Uh, parenthesis, uh, one of the many interesting things about this picture is exactly how do you work the count? Uh, is Rubens, including himself as a philosopher, thereby making a claim for the authority of painting uh, as the equal of, of letters, humanities, and philosophy? Or is he actually making, establishing a slight difference in that, unlike the three men at the table and the bust of Seneca, he isn't looking off into space somewhere, he's looking at us. Uh, so it may be that four philosophers are actually the three men and the bust. Um, if you like, the four stooges uh, of literary studies as opposed to art. But in any case, this is a painting, and it's by Rubens, so this counts, among other things, as a self-portrait. Um, a self-portrait of the artist as well, let us say, a philosopher, uh, making a claim for the liberal status of visual art on that basis. But it's really important that precisely, having painted this picture, he's looking at us. Now, this is about us uh, and our involvement with the particular individual that is this painting. Uh, and as such, it enables itself to raise a certain question about the use of philosophy or the use of the humanities. Uh, what exactly do humanists do? Well, as we see, they talk about a book staring off into vacant space. Um, artists, on the other hand, give us the world in which that happens. To go back to a distinction that David made, there is knowledge of the world and there is knowledge in the world. Painters and humanists tend to trade in knowledge in the world. They tend to have sex rather than to talk about it. But, on the other hand, knowledge of the world of the sort that these philosophers, for instance, are, are earnestly seeking, is itself in the world. And one of the claims that painting is making for itself here is to show us precisely that. Painting visualizes, in fact, what the three philosophers in Seneca are trying to visualize in theory. Uh, and that makes all the difference. Um, so, one way in which I could gloss what I've just done and what I hope you're going to do uh, is to show you the value of interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinarity. 20, 30 years ago, a humanist like myself, primarily a student of literature, might very well have been interested in Lipsius's De Constantia. Uh, and I'd have read it uh, and thought about it and had conversations uh, about it um, and read book reviews uh, about it, but that would have been my focus. One of the things that this painting enables us to do is to try and visualize De Constantia in the world. De Constantia as it existed at the time in the visual uh, as well as intellectual context of the early 17th century. This is a picture from around 1611-1612. But by the same token, uh, this also enables me to provide a literary context for the art historical document or object that this painting is. 20 or 30 years ago, um, an art historian would have been uh, eager to establish just who the four gentlemen are and would have wanted to have made sure that that is indeed a bust of Seneca rather than, let us say, Democritus or somebody else. Um, they would have wanted to determine, if possible, what book it is exactly that they're talking about. 
Uh, and all of that in the way of identifying in a re-identifiable world what the subject of the picture is. But they would not have done what I've been trying to do, which is to introduce the interpretive arts, uh, initially devised by humanists for the study of literature, to bring them to bear on this picture. Um, so it's an example of interdisciplinarity in action. And how, in fact, interdisciplinarity does not uh, appropriate one medium of expression, one form of expression to the other, but enables a conversation to take place precisely because it respects the differences between the two. Which brings me to the window. Um, we're going further and further down the road of interdisciplinarity, but one of the things that interdisciplinarity is doing is taking us further and further out towards the wider world, and among other things, the present world. Uh, in which objects like this appear and get talked about. And bear in mind, Rubens is looking at us, not at anybody else. Whoever happens to stand in front of this picture is being looked at by Rubens. Whoever, at whatever time, in whatever place, find themselves in the presence of this picture are engaged by it directly through the glance of Rubens the painter. In any case, Rubens also makes that claim for art. Um, these guys are looking off into the wild blue yonder someplace, um, and conspicuously seated around a table. He, on the other hand, standing, and let's bear in mind that Rubens, this is another self-portrait of Rubens, in addition to being a painter, Rubens was a diplomat, so he knew a thing or two about how the wider world actually worked. Uh, but in any case, uh, in addition to sort of placing the humanists in the world, he's also giving us an image of the world uh, that lies beyond, to which they're paying no particular attention, on which indeed they've turned their backs, from which they have withdrawn in order to look at the, to the wild blue yonder. And yet, this is the wonderful thing, if you look carefully at what looks like a window, it turns out to be a tombe. It is an artful optical illusion. There is a shadow falling across the top of it that is impossible in nature if that is in fact a window. But if, on the other hand, the shadow cast by the sash there, that, 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 uh, uh, the curtain, uh, what do you call that thing with the curtains hanging down? Anyway, um, uh, I'm sounding like Sarah Palin here trying to talk about it. Uh, Russian airspace. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, the, 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 the swash, there it is. Uh, if the shadow of the swash is indeed falling across what looks like a landscape, it's not a landscape, it's a painting. Um, it's a work of art, too. Um, and it is, as such, just as relative and just as place uh, as everything else. In any event, just throwing this up as a way of illustrating uh, what it is we mean by interdisciplinarity and how then turn that into process way beyond the immediate historical context of an early 17th century painting like this uh, in the wider world uh, that we're trying to come to terms with. Like magic. While I'm changing out the uh, <laughs> technical stuff here, I've actually been sitting in the back, uh, listening mostly, and I was thinking about, I don't know, a bunch of random things were coming to mind that I wanted to share with you. So I'm the new director of Jewish Studies on campus, and so I always use any opportunity with a large group of people to share a little bit of the wisdom that I teach my students. There we go. Don't forget that. I oh, will. Um, so one, uh, the word for humanities in Hebrew, the way it's referred to at, at Israeli universities, is the sciences of the spirit, which I thought was very, I don't know, somehow telling and illuminating that it's not about the mind, actually, it's about spirit, and the word spirit in Hebrew also means the breath, so there's something very embodied about this notion of, of the humanities in Hebrew. And the other little anecdote was a story ex trying to explain why we all have this little cleft in, our, in the place above our lip. Rabbis are obsessed with explaining every phenomenon in the world, non-scientifically, precisely non-scientifically. And their explanation is that when a baby is in the womb, I'm multitasking here, when a baby's in the womb, by the woman's bedside is an angel with a candle illuminating the scene, and the angel, right before the, the kid is born, hits the kid right here, taps the kid right on the face with a hot finger that had been in the flame. And the angel's doing that, and that's why we have this. That is why we have this. Scientists will agree. <laughs> because we already know everything there is to know. 
and the angel right before a kid is born hits you here and you forget everything. And it's this notion that actually learning is remembering. That we actually all had this sense of knowledge of self from, from in utero. And that your entire life is actually about getting back to the place before you started. A little bit of Jewish philosophy. Um, last story I was going to tell us how I got into this profession. Because I have to inspire my students to actually be interested in what we're doing. And I remember sitting in my organic chemistry class in my first year of school at Berkeley when I was 18 years old. And I sat there going, why the hell am I in here? What, this has no meaning. I don't think this is going to have any spiritual import in the world. And I dropped the chemical engineering major that day and switched to history. And that brings me to be a, hist a historian today. And I, I try to foster that moment, not to say that chemical engineers shouldn't be chemical engineers, but I want them to find meaning in being a chemical engineer. Let's put it that way. So I have two things that I wanted to share with you. And I may not have understood the charge of what we were supposed to do here, but I'm a, I'm a little bit more of a practical person. So I'm interested in what it means to practice the future of the arts and humanities. What does it look like? And so I wanted to present a little piece of my own research about what I think that might look like, and then a, a new form of, of learning that I've been trying out that is at least transformative for me and I'm hoping for my students as well. So the first thing I wanted to present to you is uh, some photographs that I'm working on on this book on uh, Soviet Jewish photographers who photographed World War II and the Holocaust. And I'm presenting this material to you to think about what is the power of the arts and humanities to have, both for the individual but also in the world. In the world. In. In. Since we were talking about in versus of. So I'm writing this chapter right now on liberation. Liberation photography. And whenever I'm in a group, in a room like this, in, of Americans, I ask I, I'm going to present to you liberation photography. Those of you who know, maybe you're, you remember it, what year would liberation photography come from? So I'm in such a room. What year does liberation photography come from in, uh, from World War II, to be fair? What year? Depends what country you're asking. Aha, depends what country you're asking. So for, say, France, it might be 44. But we're in America, and literally, the first answer is always April 1945. Someone in the audience says, I still remember seeing those pictures. Um, I'll get back to that picture. So, does this photograph ring a bell for people? This is, I, I use this photograph to show a sort of canonical image of liberation. I also make it a habit sort of, of my own personal ethics. I don't tend to show pictures of dead people unless there's a particular reason to. So when I show liberation photography, I try to show ones of survivors. And this one happens to have Elie Wiesel in it. So this is April 1945. So the research I'm doing is from the Soviet Union. So it's a completely different story about World War II and the Holocaust. And when I was in residence at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, this was the photograph that they have opening the permanent exhibition. If any of you have ever been to DC, you take an elevator up to the top floor and you start and you work your way down. And this photograph is what greets you. Hor horrifying photograph from April 1945. And it sets the context that we are in a story about America. This is a story about how America relates to the Holocaust. So I went there. They asked me, to, can you come and be a fellow here? What would it look like if we did this from a Soviet perspective? So the picture that I gave them is the bottom right. The bottom right, it is what I call the first liberation photograph. Um, it's from January 1942. It's taken in southern Russia. It's from a city that was occupied by Nazi Germany for six weeks. They mass murdered all the Jews in the whole town, in a burial, buried them all out near the, near the uh, outskirts of town, and then the Soviet Union reconquered the, uh, the city. And so I showed this picture to the curator of the Holocaust Museum, and I said, this is your first liberation photograph, not April 1945. So we had this long conversation about the power of this kind of research to transform how we understand things that seem so natural and obvious to us. And now, their, uh, their exhibition start to include other narratives. It had been a very American narrative. It is, after all, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. But they're complicating the way they tell their story in the museums. And for me, as a humanities scholar, and as someone who uses the visual to tell stories, it was very important for me to have my work have that kind of transformative effect. It's one of those moments where you're like, wow, our research actually has profound effect in the world if it's getting out in the world that way. So the second thing I wanted to show you, and we, Chris and I, did, we did not plan this, but I'm going to show you my version of 
humanities scholars <laughs> doing what they do. So these are photographs. These are photographs taken about one month ago when I was the historian in residence on a uh, basically a travel course to medieval Spain, where we were studying Jewish history in medieval Spain. Anyone recognize where this is? Anyone been to Spain recently? This is the Alhambra in Granada. This is the Alhambra. This is a main tourist site in the middle of the Alhambra, right in the middle of the gardens. It's 4 p.m. There's tourists swarming around us. And this is our Rubens. This is our version of the Rubens, taken by a less talented artist, but nonetheless capturing what, in my mind, is the way humanities is going forward. So what are we doing here? We are in the Alhambra, which was a great center of Jewish learning in the 11th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, and we are studying the poetry of an Arabic Jewish medieval poet who wrote in Hebrew and Arabic on the grounds of the Alhambra where he had been the military leader of the Granada army against the Christians. And the kids, so the kids are actually studying poetry here in that place where he potentially even wrote it on, this, on these very grounds. So I, I'm calling this, I'm playing with names and people have better names, I'm calling this in situ learning. So scientists, botanists, people who work in ecology, they can go up in the mountains and actually be out in their areas of, subject, of, of study. And I think for too long, humanities has thought that our primary place to go is the salon, indoors, with a, with a nice painting behind us, or into the library. And I, I actually asked what would it look like if we brought the humanities to the place where the humanistic and the arts were actually created. And so we designed this tour where we were studying all of the texts in the places where the texts either were, or it's pretty hard to know exactly where, but at least in the areas where the people who created these texts were. And we found the experience. And I say we because the students have all, that's what this film is, the students giving their nice testimonials so people want to do this next travel trip. <laughs> um, transformative, absolutely transformative. And when you ask them, it's this very inchoate, inexplicable, I don't really know why, but somehow, Sitting in a room in, there, these guys are all from Chicago, sitting in a room at the University of Chicago studying this poetry, it is, has absolutely no effect on me in comparison to sitting here in the middle of the Alhambra, where this stuff would have been written. And I haven't yet theorized what place has to do with the humanities, like the role that place plays, working on that. But the outcome is there. Like, I'm actually right now just interested in, in the practice, and so I'm actually starting to generate these kinds of courses where we take our students to places where these humanities and arts were created and have them studying primary texts, not around a table in a salon, but literally on the floor on a marble mosaic. And I, for me, this notion of transformation, which is a, frankly it's a banal word that we all use over and over again, except when you see it. And when you see it happening, you know it. It's again, untheorizable, inexplicable science of the soul that you see when you have a bunch of kids studying medieval poetry out in the middle of Spain. And so my, for me, the future of the arts and humanities is about thinking about how it makes meaning in people's lives, and also thinking about how it affects the way we all think about narrative, history, story, and self. And I think these guys got a lot out of that. And I'm happy to tell you more about how to organize such an in-situ learning experience. towards a new vision of itself. Um, my presentation is going to be a little different uh, from what most others have done and probably will do because I'm giving a report of something that, um, that I was involved in last year. <clears throat> As many of you know, the Department of English in 2007-2008 held, <clears throat> held a year-long series of four colloquia designed to assess, as we call it, the state of the literature profession. The colloquia produced two outcomes, each of which I'll refer to here, a set of principles about the nature and desirability of such discussions, and a particular set of emphases for 21st century humanities and arts programs, and some of them you'll recognize from what you've already heard. 
In each colloquium, two speakers, invited from around the country, eight in all, presented to the department faculty and graduate students, and I might add to a number of um, administrators, uh, their reports on where the humanities and arts as an institution, in their view, is, or in most cases, can be. The talks were followed by discussions, dinners for speakers and faculty members, and the following day an informal working luncheon with faculty members and speakers. We planned the series working from the conviction, uh, and this echoes something that Jeff said at the beginning, that humanities departments spend far too much time making important programmatic and hiring decisions based upon exigencies and far too little time making those decisions out of commitment to principles and out of concerted inquiries into conceptual, institutional, national, and historically based explorations over time. The hope was that by bringing new voices, a new discourse into our thinking, we could develop, develop sounder reasons for the growth of our department. We laid down just one law for our discussions. Only speculative engagement with our current program would be allowed. Our opening speaker, the poet Lynn Higinian, a professor at UC Berkeley, set the tone by imagining what she called a dream department <clears throat> and elaborated the phrase. On the one hand, a dream department, and this could be applied to any number of humanities programs, studies dreams in the sense of acts of mind and imagination, um, and as Michelle said earlier, transformations of perspective. On the other hand, a dream department would be an ideal one, which we might re reach by dreaming it, moving past the exigencies together. What themes and emphases recurred over the course of the colloquia? I will indicate a few of them here. Find full summaries and videos of the first three colloquia on our department website. First, and this accords with what Chris and David have described, response to globalism took center stage. For example, Yale's Y.G. Dimmick asked us to think about a more global approach to a very American writer, Washington Irving, whose American interest in tales and sketches came from his economically enforced stay in Germany, during which time he learned German folklore. And his apparent Arabization of the American Indian was seen as a function of his sojourn to the Alhambra in Spain and his writing about that. Virginia's Marlon Ross, Stanford's David Palumbo Lou, and Brown's William Keach, in a complementary vein, made us consider the excitement for both writer and critic in describing versions of the other from the other's point of reference. And here I think David's work is spot on in that, as an example of that kind of uh, reorientation of, of talking about what's beyond our ken. Uh, meanwhile, Hedginian and UC Santa Barbara's Alan Liu brought to the table the value of collaboration in research and education. Hedginian describing collaborations with members of the urban community in the making of poems, and Liu pro proposing a model more familiar to the sciences of collaboration between faculty and students along non-traditional disciplinary lines, education through collaborative research. In his work, the new media, became a springboard for a radical expansion of focus. And yet, a concern arose, enunciated by our final speaker, William Keach, that inevitably there were huge determining issues that no one had raised. He mentioned three. The place of composition studies in our programs. The place of language learning, particularly with a new global emphasis. And the fact of disenfranchised members of our community teachers not on the tenure track, and potential students for whom higher education is not economically available. My point in mentioning this is to indicate areas, first of all, that still need addressing, but also to enforce my earlier plea that to succeed in, reconfiguring the, uh, in the reconfiguring of humanities and arts programs, to catch as many issues as possible, we need to think and converse over time and not be pressured into acting immediately. Having said that, I think that we can act immediately. In making proposals for our future, I recommend that we build in a structure of continual, open-ended discussion and exploration. The humanities and arts are too complex to do anything else. Otherwise, I'm dead certain that we will simply reinvent the wheel. Let me conclude by mentioning a specific program, uh, proposal spearheaded and drafted for the English department by my colleague, colleague Karen Jacobs, emerging immediately out of last year's inquiry.
Karen dreamed for us what we are calling experimental working groups, small gatherings of faculty, possibly crossing disciplinary lines, whose research and potentially educational interests are, de are defined outside of traditional institutional categories, such as verbal visual art, the history of the book, performance, and so forth. These groups, which would probably have to seek their own funding, could over time teach, perhaps through collaboration with their students, their explorations, and thus push their own work, but also the humanities, forward in unexpected ways. Thank you. Involved in those working groups? Was it departments across the humanities? Or? You mean the experimental working yeah, groups? Yeah, your experimental oh, working groups. Oh, uh, that's wither. <laughs> the, the proposal has been made. And, and it would mean outside of the Department of English. It could. But it, not necessarily. Well, it could be whatever anybody wanted. Yeah. You know? And that, as someone, I can't remember, said that we could perhaps think in terms of uh, you know, different perspectives within a discipline. Yeah. But also, I mean, certainly in some of these that were suggested, um, uh, and one that I didn't mention, one on surrealism, um, which was conceived of as, as, you know, environmental design, literature, fine arts, music, you know, all of, all of that together. So it has yet to be done. But, but Alan Liu uh, at Santa Barbara has uh, started versions of this already uh, for some time now, actually. Uh, and um, uh, so I, our, our notion of experimental working groups comes in part from that. Warren? Uh, just in, just in that same perspective, it seems to me that certain working groups of that same ilk have been funded already in Canada, in Canadian universities, it's meant by the, by the, by the Canadian government. Uh, perhaps somebody here can confirm that, but, but it suggests that one of the answers to the is, in fact, Canada. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> This particular program was independent and funded by a foundation okay. that was trying to get this kind of learning off the ground. I don't know how summer school, I assume you have travel courses here. I'm new to campus, yeah. by the way. So, But in terms of structure, uh, yeah, so funding it, I presume you have X number of students pay to enroll in a summer course that covers the cost of the instructor and they pay the, their travel costs to get there and that's generally that's how they're funded. In terms of structure, the course probably would have something like a week before you go on the trip of learning, prep, study, then you're gone for a week and then you come back for a week to, uh, to debrief and, and write. And In terms of the kinds of projects they could be doing, on this particular project we had some digital filmmakers making their own films, we had two photographers, we had a poet who shared her poetry at the, on the last night. Like, it was very, let's call I think, what is it, exper experiential learning, I bet, which to me that's experiential plus humanities equals transformative learning. At least that's what I saw. Laurel? I just follow up on that for a minute because as it happens, Monday or perhaps Tuesday, we're sort of raising studies is going to be sending out a email seeking proposals from CU faculty who would like to organize courses in East Asia, and we do have funding. Um, for uh, subsidizing those courses, which um, you know, certainly help. We did four of these um, a few years ago, some foundation funding, and they're designed to do what, what David was just describing, which is to engage students in the culture, in the um, company of a, a faculty member who's an expert in whatever disciplinary area they happen to teach. So I hope that all of you will apply. We, we have a, um, uh, funding in perpetuity, actually. It's an endowment. Yes, and, and Classics runs a day every summer in Rome, which is also interesting. And I, just to, two things, one quick thing is that it's transformative for me, too. Like, we keep talking about what the students are getting out of this, but I, like, our souls should be nurtured from the work that we're doing, too. And getting to study this stuff there was also transformative for the way I understood this material and the people who, who wrote it. So we get a little something out of it, too. Yep. Yeah, I was struck by the word. Twitter that was used here. 
between the violent and impetuous movement of rush and attack, onset, a smart blow or stroke, a blast. And I think about the arts and humanities doing that. How can we move away from where we are so that we are a violent uh, push in a new direction? And I, one of the things that's been talked about here several times is in, to be in the world. And one of the things that I think that we need to think about in the arts and humanities is that we should be citizens of the world, not just citizens of the university. And by citizens of the world, I mean we shouldn't create events for students to come to us, for the community to come to us. We should go to the community. Uh, we should go out there and be in there, take what we know, because they don't understand what we do. Here, we're talking to each other. We can you know, argue what is and, and the humanities, and what is the arts, but they have no idea what we are. They see us as strange beings. And the only way you get beyond that is take what you know and become a citizen of the world and communicate out there because then they begin to see and hear how we think, what we think is important. Just in our conversation, without a lesson, just a conversation with someone else. And I think that being removed, philosophers, artists, being removed from the world out there, the theater is a different thing. It has theater here, but also has things out there. But nonetheless, but I think that we're, they, they see us as removed. And I think that if we're going to plan for the future and plan how the arts and humanity is going to flourish in the future, how are we going to make a violent impetus movement out there? I think that we have to think about moving and making those connections outside of academia with the people that need us the most and the population in general. And I think that being here and just thinking and just talking to ourselves, I, I thought about what if we're having this conversation out here in the community, whether it's in Aspen, Boulder, Denver, Pueblo, would they even understand what we're talking about? And, and I think that one of the uh, one of the things that we in the arts and humanities, you know, need to do, and why we're so defensive, the scientists can tell them what they're talking about. But we, a lot of times, don't know how to explain that, because we are apart from the world. We're here at academia. And academia, I understand, you really understand me, and we have incredible intellectual conversations. But how do we make that conversation understandable out there, so that we don't have to be on the defensive? If they, the more they understand us, the better citizens they become. The more we engage with the community as the humanities and the arts, the more citizens of the world we become. And that to me is a violent movement for us as we try to plan for the future. Because the future, we have to look at how do we, otherwise we do the same thing we're doing again. We're going to reevaluate what our disciplines are and we're going to talk about different ways we can talk to each other and make this here for students. And we leave out most of the people that never come to college, that need us, that need us under, to understand what ethics is all about, what art is all about, how, it, what, how these ideas enrich us as human beings. We explain it to each other, but we never have that conversation with them out there so they can talk to us because we talk here in a language that only we understand. And we need to explain it like the scientists can explain it. So I'm just going to explain how you make that little light tie. You can explain that. She can explain that. How we come up with these ideas that transform us, we need to explain I, I out there. Do you mind introducing yourself? Because I'm, I'm new on campus. Sorry. Mind introducing myself? I'm George Rivera from the Department of Art and Art History. I'm an artist, art critic, and a, and a curator. And I'm very concerned about how we separate ourselves from the world of the university. And I think and that I just, that's an issue that's give important. Give us a second, George. I'm very, I always encourage my students to use the I as opposed to the we. And I'm feeling a little bit defensive at the presumption that I, and I'm, gonna, I'm hearing what you're saying to me because you used we, everyone in this room. I came here from the Boulder Jewish Community Center where I volunteered to come to their monthly meeting and teach. I took 50 Russian Jews to Spain who don't have an didn't have an opportunity to get a higher education. That was community-based learning. So I hear your critique. I would make the same critique. But I think you're making an assumption about 
the people and the motivations in this room that may be true for some people, but I, I hesitate to, to lay blanket critiques on what we're doing in this room. Because I, 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 I didn't want it's not to put you on the defense, it's as much to put myself on the defense. It's <laughs> a enough. question of myself. But it's I think there are people in this room it's doing not, exactly it's, like, it's not about you, it's about how we relate. As I, as I said earlier, I think that you're involved, you're involved out there, but we need to be more involved or we're much more visible. And not just in those little community centers. Out there where they're dealing with right now, who they're electing, what, how does these issues of what we know help them with that? Uh, that, and, and those are that's different than being in the center. It's being engaged with one's community with the knowledge that one has. That's what it is. But that that, that two things, uh, George. One of them is um, I suddenly find myself entertaining myself with the vision of uh, getting a copy of De Constantia, heading down to Times Square in New York, and saying De Constantia here. Anybody want to talk about it? I mean, there are logistical limits to what one can do in order to take the arts and humanities out there. But but there's another. But there's people want to know about that. Absolutely, I hear you. Not Times Square shall we get before the the big clock. I hear you. I hear you. But I'm just pointing out, you know, you go to schools, you go to community groups, you go to church meetings, because that's that's a venue where. The person who's trying to take this out of the academy and the people out in the world who want to receive it can actually find each other. So that's one point. But the other one is, I think, uh, I'm more optimistic than you are in that uh, there is something that we actually do here and preeminently are able to do here that does actually have an impact out there, and that's transform our students. Um, it's not just a question of me as a professor of literature going out into the world, though I try to do as much of that as I possibly can. But it's also a question of changing the minds and lives of our students uh, by what we show them. And I think uh, I, I may be deluding myself. I may be flattering myself. I think I'm a very powerful I think you transformer. Do that. I think you do that. I'm just saying that is not enough. That's all I'm saying. That is not enough of the world. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Um, my comment is quick. Uh, I tend to agree with what you're saying, but I also want to caution against the kind of elitism that says, oh, we have to go out and talk to the little people, the masses, you know? Uh, personally, I think that the university does a fairly good job of publicizing the events and the talks that it has. Um, there are other things it could do. Um, when I was in high school, there was uh, this philosophy summer seminar um, that's been discontinued since then, and I'm sorry about that. No? Uh, I heard from Devin Belcher that it's there, there's two discontinued. Different. One, one is still going, the other one is the same. Ah, well, see, it's still in progress. Um, so I, I think the university does fairly well, and that we shouldn't, we should be wary in the position that, you know, we have to go out and educate the masses, you know. There's a gentleman back there who wanted to speak. Yes, you. Yeah. But there's a role. Is there, is there a role um, for the quote public intellectual? I hate to use those phrases, those words, but you are a citizen, and we, we teach our students that you know prudence, justice, work, and temperance are civic virtues, and we have a kind of responsibility. And when we go out into the uh, into the community, there are decisions that have a direct impact on the arts and humanities, for example, in high schools. Um, those are the things that get cut uh, with a budget. There are certain priorities, there are certain choices and decisions that we make. And as citizens, we have not to teach people uh, or to teach the little people, but to, but, but to speak up in terms of the value of what we do or the value of what humanities does for all of those students. Uh, I mean, I think that's the point. Well, I would tend to think it's, it's, it's probably uh, a mistake to try and go out there to talk about the value of what we do, because that's not only self-serving uh, and self-referential, but it, it, more to the point is to go out there and talk about what people are concerned about, uh, what people are interested in. Uh, and it's also to let them know why what you're interested in also matters. Okay. Cool. How about you, and then and then you, and Green, and then and then you. Well, I'm neither a student nor faculty here at the university, so maybe I don't really have a place here, but I do value knowledge. And, um, you know, talking about getting the knowledge out there is important because, you know, we all say knowledge is valuable, but somewhere up the chain says knowledge is valuable, if you know what I mean. 
uh, the evil administration or some he such. Is evil. <laughs> um, and you know, there's a lot we could do to kind of, you know, I, I live here in Boulder, I use this campus as a resource, you know, without explicit permission all the time. And, um, and I find it really valuable to me, but I feel like that if we really think knowledge is valuable, and if we're really trying to get it out there, there is a lot more we could do. And I don't say we go preach in Times Square the value of knowledge, um, but you know, uh, take MIT, they've got their open courseware program where they've got videos of their classes online, and you know, for free. Yeah, you can just go on there and watch them. And, uh, and you know, we could take that type of approach, you know, we've got technology to get things out. We could have the administration encouraging um, people to write uh, open source textbooks where people can get a hold of textbooks and stuff. And if, you know, there seems to be this fear that if we, you know, somewhere up the chain, not with us, but that if we um, get the knowledge out there, then the universities just won't be able to sustain themselves, you know? Um, you know, we'd love to be government funded or something, but we're not, we need the inflow of cash. But I think that if we kind of go against that and spread the knowledge out, then the humanities would have a lot more <coughs> interest. You know, if someone can go read about philosophy without having to pay for a philosophy class, then they may be more inclined to get a philosophy degree realizing what the value of it actually is. Um, yeah, so try to get things out there more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love the direction that you set this on, and partly it was your institute learning, and George does a great deal of that too. And I want to make a case for the museum, the library, and many of the other centers here that are um, great connectors to the community and really carry forward that American University land grant mission. The first public museum, so to speak, in the world was the Oxford Ashmolean. Or, and that was, so the first public museum was the university museum. The first non-university -pub, non public museum was the Schinkel Museum in Germany. But at that sense of the public sphere, it's not only the museum, it's also the library. Uh, the performing arts complexes, but these are the places where not only can they come and see not that Rubens painting, but we have a Bruegel painting, but we could invite scholars of all different backgrounds, Asianists, yeah. poets, to come and do things in that space with that art. Um, so I do think uh, I'll be making my case as the beginning of a great investment with the visual arts complex, but the great deal of investment that's needed on the staffing Huge. I mean, staff of four relative to staffs of 12 to 25 of our peers. That means big 12. People that have taken that, that investment more seriously. Um, this American pragmatism, do we others about how we learn and how we learn directly with works of art or, or at the Alhambra. So that's, that's what I want to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am. Uh, I think a lot of the presentations have talked about the academic benefit of interdisciplinary studies, and I don't know to what extent uh, the speakers have looked into the research on, on interdisciplinary studies, but my question is whether as part of the benefit that they looked at the uh, uh, interdisciplinary studies as an antidote to what linguists refer to as uh, is uh, viewer bias, that is to say that you're breaking breaking the frames within which the disciplines have uh, traditionally looked at, at the world, and so they they uh, have an opportunity to, to uh, interact with other disciplines and thereby come up with new new visions, new understandings of the world uh, by, by breaking those, those frames. Uh, I don't have a view. In my own experience, I've certainly found that that's been the case, um, that um, you know, by presenting uh, literature in relation in dialogue with painting or with uh, philosophy or divinity, even. I'm an early modernist, I get to do stuff like that. Um, uh, it does break down um, the, the barriers in students' mind uh, about various modes of, of reflection and, 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 and experience as well. The other thing I've also found about it, though, is that um, it Particularly, you know, we live in a visual culture, notoriously. Um, our students actually spent a lot of time on the web, and they, and they spent a lot of time looking at images there. They watch a lot of TV. They're very proficient at it. And one thing that I find uh, in the classroom is that by leading in through images, I actually ultimately empower them actually to start talking about texts. 
Um, so it's not just that we break down the barriers between the disciplines. I awaken skills, um, active uh, learning skills, uh, in one area by uh, drawing on them in another. So totally agree with you. Well, another wonderful panel in, in echoing George's words, we certainly did hope that these kind of conversations would get a wind blowing through the humanities and arts and make a change. Since after the break, we're bringing on the administrators, please check the violence, however. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but the, 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 the kind of conversation that we, we hope to have in the last panel is relevant to all of what we've been talking about. We've, a lot of what we've been talking about is how do we, we get out what we do to different kinds of audiences, to our colleagues, to our students, to the, the public outside. Well, one of the main consumers of language about what we do are evil administrators. So we'll have a conversation about that after we have a break.